Hello. Dan oh, all the heads pop up. That was awesome. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. It, it seems about half the people walked in with rolly bags, so we're close to the taxi line on the way out. So I promise, stay for the whole thing. It's worth it. Uh, but thank you all so much for coming, and, and I hope you've had a fabulous few days at, at KubeCon, and, and we're, we're hoping to, to continue that trend, um, sharing uh, some stories from Spotify, and in particular, a use case around gRPC. Um, so our talk, oops, I did it again. Uh, we build gRPC. Um, today we're going to talk about a, a kind of a common theme throughout the history of Spotify and kind of why it is the way it is, um, and, and dig into a case study uh, around gRPC and, and talk about where we are today and, and how we plan to move forward. First, I'll start by introducing us. Uh, I'm Austin, and this is Dave. Uh, we build infrastructure at Spotify. Uh, basically, we build the boxes that tens of thousands of services go in and all the lines on the architecture diagrams that connects them, uh, and basically figure out how that all gets to the backend data stores and, and make all of that work. Um, it's, it's sort of like this, where, where we have music and podcasts and all sorts of things. They're really, for the purposes of this talk, not fundamentally important, but, but just kind of showing you where, where we sit uh, with, within the Spotify ecosystem. Um, so really, you touched it. Uh, You're welcome. But let's just say it's, it's not quite that simple. Um, things get a little bit complicated, and, and particularly for Spotify, um, it's, it's everywhere. Uh, and hopefully all of you use it. Um, but, but we have not just kind of the mobile apps and desktop apps that you think about, but there's a lot of hardware that it's out there running on. 150 plus speakers, smart TVs, smart, other smart devices, running across 70 plus different countries, some of them with slower, maybe not LTE connections, and in figuring out how we get all of this heavy data um, to customers really, really quickly is a, is a big and exciting challenge for us. Um, and hey, look, buzzword, CNCF technologies, um, we use a lot of them, um, and we're excited to be big contributors to them and, and evangelists for them. Um, but these technologies are, are, at the end of the day, a, a means to an end. Um, and they're a means to serving customers an exceptional listening experience, in, in our case. And, and really, for us, they're, they're a way that we can kind of collectively work with this community to build really sound underpinnings to move developers faster and faster in, in their quest to build features and, and incredible experiences. But, but there was a time before them. Um, and, and it really, it, it wasn't always this way. And, and frankly, I wasn't even at Spotify for a lot of some of the history that we'll share with you. And, and I'll hand it over um, to, to Dave to do a little bit of a background. And I wasn't around for most of that history either, but I'll still just talk about it anyway. So uh, I think a few of our talks have talked about some of this, but it's really important kind of setting the stage for some of the stuff we're talking about. So it starts when we were still in data centers uh, at a time before all those fun buzzwords. We were managing all of our own hardware, all of our own networks, uh, all of that fun stuff. And at that point, we were very rapidly growing. And the goal really was just to stay alive as a company and keep up with the pace and make sure that everything kept working and the music would keep streaming. So we weren't terribly worried about things like whether or not the way our service was interacting with each other is open source or powered by community or will work tomorrow because we just really needed it to work today and we'll deal with tomorrow tomorrow. And at that point, we solved a lot of really interesting, really challenging engineering problems that we often spoke about at conferences like this, but we solved them very much in our own proprietary ways. Um, then we got to a point where we realized that we really didn't want to be in the business of managing any of our own hardware. We had a lot of the kind of typical reasons for wanting to move to cloud that everyone talks about. They don't want to manage their hardware. They don't want to manage their switches. Uh, they don't want to have to worry about various things like a network cable dies in a data center somewhere and you have to send someone out and fix it, all of that fun stuff. So we decided to move to public cloud. And at this point, we really were focusing entirely on those couple things I said. So we wanted to forklift into cloud. Uh, some people have called it lift and shift. So we were running effectively the exact same architecture we had on-prem, just in the cloud. We were, instead of running on VMs on our own hardware, we were running VMs on someone else's hardware. Um, I won't get into what we did on the data pipeline side. That didn't really work so well as a forklift, but we have a bunch of talks about that elsewhere. But on the backend service side, and especially with things like uh, container orchestration, inter service communication, we really ran all of our own stuff just somewhere else. And the biggest reason for this was that we really just wanted to move out of our data centers very quickly. We didn't want to focus on multiple things at once. And that worked extremely well for this migration. And on the other hand, 
it kind of put us in a place where there was a clear next step, a clear next migration. And even while we were doing that first one, we had been talking a lot about uh, cloud native. And at that point, we just used the term and we hadn't really defined what it meant. To a lot of people, it just meant uh, shut down your VM, da your databases on VMs and use managed storage. Or now we can use uh, services like Google PubSub or uh, Kinesis and AWS instead of using Kafka. But we hadn't really thought through like the full definition of something like cloud native. We just said, whenever we're done with this thing, we'll, be, we'll work on the cloud native thing. And that's kind of where we're now. We recently moved on from shutting down our data centers and started working on this. And we've started by trying to define cloud native and then work towards it. And here, just like last time, we have kind of a core set of goals. And a couple of the obvious ones are things like resilience. Um, a lot of the resilience patterns in cloud are very different from what we've seen in our data centers. Um, we, on the one hand, see many more failures, and on the other hand, the failures are much, much shorter lived and much quicker to recover. So all of the things that we used to do to recover from failures in our data centers uh, don't really work as well anymore. So we have to change a lot of those practices to truly take advantage of the cloud. Um, obviously, operability, things like not having to worry about the operational toil of dealing with all of our data centers is much less. And then there's a bunch of easy wins that I'm sure you've all heard of with cloud, things like quick provisioning and all of that. Um, and then there's a bunch of observability, like both wins and challenges, obvious challenges like in a very ephemeral environment like cloud are existing on-prem, not very ephemeral built tools don't work very well. Then there's a bunch of next level things like looking at how to be more cost effective in cloud where we can do things like get different machine sizes, things like that. But the overall goal, much the same as it was when we moved to cloud, is focus, is allowing us as a music streaming company to focus as many of our people, as many of our financial resources on being a better music streaming company as opposed to a better infrastructure company or a better VM hosting company or any of these stages. So like I said, this really is kind of two separate jumps, uh, one to cloud, one to cloud native. And I kind of ask which is harder, but I think I've already really set up that clearly the second one is the much harder one because the way that we did the first one, we kind of cut a line of where the layer of abstraction is and it's really at kind of very physical infrastructure and we're moving out of that. Whereas all of the next step is at a much higher layer, it's much closer to people's business logic. A lot of it actually is architecture of their services to make them truly work in this cloud native environment. Uh, and I want to touch a little bit on some of the changes that we have to make across our architecture and across some of our services to get there. And I think I just said had to make, but we're very much still in the process of doing it, so I can't use the past tense there. So let's go back. Let's go way back, but not quite to 1985, probably a little closer to 2010. We built all of these things to operate all of the core infrastructure across Spotify. And there were a bunch of obvious things we needed, uh, like we needed a really good inter-service communication framework. And we started by using simple things that were readily available like HTTP 1 and REST. And we found a bunch of reasons why that didn't work at very high scale, especially for large amounts of binary data that we were passing around for various things. So we needed something. And at that time, we didn't have any great alternatives. So after not finding anything easily, we built our own thing. We built this thing called Hermes on uh, zero MQ. Uh, same thing in the container orchestration world. We at that point had transitioned, or were working on transitioning all of our backend services to run in Docker containers. And we need something that could orchestrate the number of services we had across all of our VMs reliably. And in 2013, there wasn't really a good option out there. Having not found one, we built one. We built Helios, uh, the thing that Dan Cohen mentioned the other day. Uh, same thing for monitoring. We needed a, a scalable monitoring solution that could monitor all of our services and do both uh, storing all that data in the time series database as well as giving graphing and dashboarding solutions to all of our teams in a good multi-tenant, easily managed way. Uh, we didn't find anything great, so we built our own things. Uh, some based on open source solutions, uh, some not. Uh, we open sourced the time series database. We didn't open source the, graphic, the dashboarding tool, but we still built all of it. And because we had all these custom things, there were a bunch of kind of next level things like tracing that we just didn't have because there was no easy way to get tracing kind of for free on a completely custom inner, uh, inner service communication platform like ours. On the other hand, of course, we did our best to use what was out there when we found something. Like I said, we were using Docker containers. We didn't invent our own containerization mechanism. Um, obviously, things like VMs and all the lower layers, we used standard things that existed. But throughout all of this, we had this kind of funny relationship with open source where on the one hand, we clearly saw a lot of value in working with open source communities and in 
both using existing open source and community provided things as well as building our own. And we had some success with building our own things and open sourcing them uh, and some things that didn't really work very well. Uh, we open sourced a bunch of things ranging from uh, Maven plugins to data orchestration tools. And some of them did very well, actually like the data orchestration tools around Luigi and things like that and our Maven Docker plugin did very well. But on the other hand, we open sourced hundreds of other things and most of those really are still only used by us. And the same thing kind of goes the other way. As we looked around trying to find whatever solutions we could, if something open source existed that worked for our solution, we, for our problem, we used it. But we very rarely found something that didn't work for us and then committed to making it work for us and working with the community to get there. So it kind of goes both, goes both ways and we've struggled to get either one of those two to be a really sustainable, good model. So to summarize here, I think that one. Yep. Uh, to summarize here, like the, the really we, we tried to open source, we, we did open source in a lot of ways, but, but it wasn't a big focus and, and it wasn't something that we could fully in, invest in and, and jump, jump in on. Um, and, and so these tools didn't come without side effects. We, we had a bunch of positive ones. Uh, we're still here, the, the company exists, we built things, they worked. Um, and, and that infrastructure that we built, it scaled. Um, and most important, it gave us this underlying confidence that we could solve challenge and challenging engineering problems and, and do so in a fast, effective and scalable way. But it came with some less positive ones too. We, we had this occasional divergence from the industry and, and in particular now CNCF and, and that makes it hard to compose these technologies over time. As, as new ones come and you're kind of relying on, on proprietary or, or in-house ones, it's, it's hard to, to take the assumptions of the new systems and, and compose them together nicely. And, and secondly, we had this bias toward building versus adopting. Um, or, or collectively building to solve these use cases, as Dave talked about, and, and this is really the, the more challenging one. Um, this, this is the one that, that I think we, we have struggled with still, because the, the first one, it, it's, it's, it's okay, and then we can figure it out, and, and what we hear is, like, we're not alone in these. Uh, there's a lot of people in this position, there's a lot of people with these technologies, and figuring out what the right intentional choices to make are moving forward. And so for the first one, um, it's, it's in progress, we're migrating. A lot of the things we're moving, it's, it's fairly clear. We can kind of see what the, the right technologies are, help supplement them where, where necessary. Um, and, and kind of, it's, it's a, a thing we're figuring out. Kubernetes, Grafana, open telemetry now. Uh, gRPC, things like that. And the other is, is much harder, and it's, it's shifting from, from kind of being a, a, an early adopter or, or late adopter in some cases to some of these technologies and, and being more innovative, but innovating with the community and not innovating in a silo. So to dig into the second one, the, the harder one, we're, we're doing the case study on gRPC and, and essentially the tying back to the title, it's we, we say like, oops, we did it again. It's We're, we're referring to those, those technologies that we built where, where now there are or, or in the future there will be um, industry standards in those spaces and, and figuring out how we don't go build a gRPC um, and, and instead how we, how we build one thing collectively and kind of skate to, to where everybody's going. So gRPC, uh, likely if you're here, you know about it, you know what it is. Um, it was established in 2015-ish. Obviously Google had things before that, um, stubby. Uh, and, and so it's an open modern, uh, modern open source RPC framework. Lots of you use it. It's maintained, documented, and supported by everyone for everyone. It can be run anywhere. Okay, it's a little hard on, on web apps uh, and those smart devices we mentioned, but we're helping trying to figure that out. Um, and, and it supports awesome things, load balancing, tracing, health checking, authentication, and more. Uh, and, and those things are all supported out of the box. They, they aren't things that, that you have to go build and support for a use case that you need. It's, it's kind of already built in and provided by, by the technology itself. Then introducing, as Dave mentioned, Hermes. Uh, and no, it's not uh, the, the Greek god of trade, heraldry, merchants, commerce, roads, thieves, trickery, sports, travelers, and athletes from Greek mythology, nor is it the Parisian brand uh, with trendy scarves and those hideous Apple watches. Um, it's, it's an in-house RPC-ish framework, um, and it's something that, that we introduced in 2012-ish. Um, it's internal to Spotify, it's not something that's been open source. It supports our existing use cases. It's well maintained, it's well documented, it's well tested. It's used throughout the Spotify stack. Spotify engineers have, have good familiarity with it. Um, and, and frankly, it works. It's not, it's not a really a big pain point. Um, and so the, the question is like, why would we transition? Um, and, and this was something that, that we were met with as, as maintainers and, and builders of infrastructure. It was like, well, we wanna move so that we can compose these things. And, and we kind of came up with this, this set of, of things that we thought was valuable. 
We thought these were wins. We thought these were the ticket to selling people on gRPC at Spotify. There's less boilerplate. We can generate clients. That's awesome. But engineers will love that, right? Um, it'll be quicker onboarding, not just like new languages, but new developers as well. A new developer will come in from, from another company or another role and they'll know what gRPC is and, and they'll know how to use it and perhaps they've used it in past roles and, and that's kind of a, a taken understanding instead of figuring out that Hermes exists, what it is and how we use it and that it's actually not that confusing. Um, it's easier integration with third-party tooling, Envoy, Service Mesh, uh, we're a GCP shop, so a lot of the Google Cloud technologies sort of take it as an assumption in, in some places or at least definitely support it. Um, and then you certainly have the resiliency patterns, um, circuit breaking, hedging deadlines, things like that that, that, it, that it's known for. And so we, 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 we kind of came out and we're like, the, these are the upsides, right? And we quickly saw that a lot of people didn't really care because the people that a lot of the people Austin just talked about were new engineers onboarding or new things onboarding. And the people that have to migrate to gRPC are the current engineers on their current services. And it, with, for them, looking at a bunch of the things that we just threw on that list didn't really matter because they already have their existing resiliency patterns and the way they do things. So we had a bunch of conversations with people and these are just some of the better quotes from things like our internal stack overflow of people just really seeing this as a lot of work to rebuild all of their service endpoints and potentially their clients for what felt like very little gain to them. And they were completely right, because like Austin said, what we had worked pretty well, like Hermes worked very well for all the use cases we had. And we were speaking to them in, about things we cared about, not things they cared about. And I took this picture last year at KubeCon uh, I forget who was actually doing the presentation, so I can't give them credit, but effectively found the same problem. So we both kind of should have known this already and potentially should have talked to some people and known this already, but most developers really just want to build something and ship it quickly. They don't want to have to worry about whatever the underlying infrastructure is or like this thing says, whatever their timeout values are or all of these things, like what port their services are on. They just want their stuff to work and the infrastructure team to handle it. We started using this metaphor, at least among a few of us, of it being just actual infrastructure. Like when you're driving your car and you just want to get from point A to point B, you don't really want to know about the infrastructure problems that some exit ramp or some crazy highway has. You just want to be able to drive on it or be redirected around it and get there, but not be told, oh, these are the details of it. Here's why you have to go there and do these 30 things to build an exit to go around it. And so all that stuff was great, but it's really not the thing that people truly cared about. And then we started digging in with some of the people because a bunch of the same people that wrote those Stack Overflow posts saying that they didn't see much value in the things you're asking for were also very strong evangelists for gRPC. So we had to figure out, well, if you are so against, or if you don't see as much value in the things that we're pushing, why are you so excited about this? And they came up with a whole bunch of other really interesting things. Um, the first obvious few are things like message integrity. It's a lot harder to build encryption and really good message integrity, things like, um, even just kind of simple checks and mechanisms all the way across all of our services. When all of our code for inter-service communication is proprietary and our own, of course we can do it and then roll it out across the fleet and get everyone running there, but it takes a lot of effort. And something like using gRPC and using a bunch of built-in features that we can get from our cloud provider would just give us a lot of that. So it felt like an obvious thing that they really want. But the other thing is as gRPC becomes more and more widely adopted, and like Austin said, we are in, G we are in GCP and a lot of GCP services uh, if we interact with a lot of GCP services over gRPC anyway, so if all of our interactions with those, that platform is over gRPC, then a lot of the practices we might do, whether it's for the message integrity things or even just for authentication and kind of every other layer of inner service communication becomes the same across the board, and then things become much, much easier for those same developers that might not care about easier onboarding or less boilerplate. Now they care because everything is uniform, everything is the same. And the other really big win in that uniformity space is global monitoring when everything is running on the same platform, when everything is running gRPC, and every service as well as every uh, cloud provider provided service and most everything you interact with has the same set of metrics, then you easily can see all the things you care about, whether it's latency or error rates or request rates, anything like that in the exact same way in the same types of dashboards in the same places. And that was actually really valuable. And that's what eventually drove a bunch of our customers to care. So pulling things kind of together in, into the things that we learned in this process and, and as we continue on with, with other use cases and, and try to, as Bernice Spears says, not, not do it again, um, we, we've learned a, a couple of key things and kind of three takeaways that, that we wanted to leave you with. 
Um, the first is that infrastructure problems are not developer problems. Largely when, when you're in this infrastructure domain or, or in this platform domain or, or whatever you call it um, within, within your context, they're, they're not the same. Um, we're, we're trying to build things that, that accelerate and enable and, and make developers contributing to these customer experiences, sometimes just the same developer in a, in a different part of their job, 10 times faster, um, you, you can actually slow them down um, by getting into the details of a lot of what these technologies are. And it's, it's up to these infrastructure teams to figure out ways as we build platforms on platforms. This has been a common theme to make sure that we're, we're focusing on, on who the, the right customer is in that case. And, and in this case, that customer is these, these developers or people building features um, that, that actually provide value to the, the end customer of your product. Um, actively kind of calling out this, this sentiment of, of things like not being invented here is actually something that, that we found hugely important. Um, we, we saw that in the, in the process of, of kind of shifting the conversation from more than gRPC is really good and Hermes sucks, like people were still sort of opposed even when we presented it in terms of the problems that it solved for them. Uh, and, and, th and, and at that, we sort of realized that this, this not invented here, something you've, you've heard at probably other Spotify talks this week or at other conferences from us is, is big. We have a lot of really senior, incredible engineers who, who have built awesome technologies and become attached to them. Um, and, and, and partially just because of that history and context. And, and there's a certain amount of um, kind of trust and respect that should be given to, to passing on and understanding when, when there's a better tech technological choice or, or something that you've built isn't, isn't the right answer. Next and third, the, the community is, is actually the, the big value driver for us. And it's, it's, a, it's a differentiator in a lot of ways. And it's something that hopefully you've seen as a trend weave through this talk. Um, where, where actually the, the community can help us learn um, and, and move a lot faster. Um, it, we can learn from the mistakes of others. Again, that's the intention of this talk, is to, is to share some of our mistakes with you so, so you can learn how to move faster. Um, but also technologically, we can, we can iterate quickly, we, could the, we can pull together our collective experience and, and design and build uh, better products. And I think you're seeing that with the Kubernetes project where sometimes it can feel like the latency of, of getting a proposal in and then the code in and merged is, seems like it's on a, a meteorological, like just a crazy time scale. But, but really what that is, is, is all of these different experiences in, in, of the community coming together to make sure that we're building the right thing and, and it's well informed. And so with that, where, where are we and, and what are we actually doing with gRPC? This is of course our favorite gRPC logo with, with pancakes having uh, been announced at the last uh, gRPC conference. Um, we're, we're focusing a lot on, on the, the tooling for clients as I sort of made the dig earlier. Like what does gRPC on, on web look like? It's, it's obviously the project is out there. Um, you'll see us at this point, we've, we've certainly created issues for it and have t done a ton of work to actually see how it could be integrated for, for many of the web applications that we do have. Um, mobile on clients is something that, that we've had a lot of challenge with. Obviously our, our clients are, are rather complicated as I mentioned earlier, figuring out how um, they, they operate in, in so many different countries with so many different uh, sort of network capabilities in terms of LTE and, and the Gs. Um, it's, a, it's a big challenge and, and latency and performance are, are hugely uh, top of mind there, especially for us. And so figuring out what the right tools are for that and, and how it works is, is key. Um, then just gRPC tooling in general. There's, there's tons of tools that, that we'd like to build and developers internally are, are either working to build and contribute back um, or, or vying for the time to build. And so our, our hope is to build this infrastructure together. And, and I think that's a common trend you'll hear from Spotify is, is how can we build infrastructure together? We say it within Spotify all the time, um, but also we say it to you as the community. Um, how can we do this? And, and how can we kind of all join hands and, and do it together? And, and those are three places we see a ton of leverage um, and opportunity. And then internally, a big success story we've seen is actually just creating a gRPC users community um, has been hugely effective. Uh, we, it started with a bunch of people coming in and actually asking questions in, in the infrastructure folks, you know, sharing their insights or tools people could use. But now we've found that the infrastructure folks hardly answer any of the questions anymore. It's all people within the community who've, who've integrated it in other parts of the company for completely different use cases, um, actually sharing their insights uh, and intelligence. And so to, to wrap it up, um, you know, we, we hope our learnings can help you and, and we, we would love to, to kind of get feedback on any of these. We'd love to get feedback on kind of the focus that we're taking with gRPC and where we feel like we can optimize. 
Um, and, and we want to do it together. Our, our hope is to build this infrastructure and, and other uh, together as we move forward. Um, and with that, you are welcome to, to ask us questions now in this forum. You're welcome to come up and ask us questions, um, or you're, you're welcome to reach out to us. Thank you very much. And if there are questions, we can take the mic around or, or however people want to ask them. Yeah. This is a little bit off topic, but um, in regard to having a lot of uh, microservices and using gRPCs, uh, you will also need a lot of uh, profiles. Uh, how are you storing them, and are you compiling you know, uh, a big package that includes all clients and all servers, and how do you manage all that? Um, because uh, we have, we have been, uh, we've been doing the same thing as you have been doing, uh, and we ended up with a single repo for all protos, but we are still not, um, we are still not sure if that was, was the right decision. So uh, what, what, are you, what are your take on, on that one? You can take it. I mean, I'll, I'll share that we started with a mistake. We started by building tooling to go support this and kind of taking this like, ooh, that's a big challenging problem. Let's go build a tool to solve it. And you can share kind of where we are now and what, what we're actually doing once we realize that building a new machine was not the answer. Yeah. Yeah, so our initial idea was to build um, not just a central repo, but a full set of like a, a bunch of tools around it, like a nice web page that looks like Swagger, all this stuff that generates all your clients, does kind of everything you'll ever want. Uh, and we quickly realized that we're effectively building an entirely new package manager for all of these things, and it's a ton of work. And at that point, we had a small handful of gRPC services. So it would be a ton of work for like five or six teams that may or may not even necessarily care. So right now, what we have is kind of like what you said. We just have a central repo of all the protos, and we've built a few simple tools for doing things like uh, pulling protos from there and generating clients, uh, like a Maven plugin that can pull from that repo and generate a Java client or the, the Java server stubs. Um, but right now, we don't quite have enough adoption to do much more than that, but we're kind of listening to all the other teams that are starting to use uh, that registry to figure out what exact things we want. And we've started looking a lot at what other teams are doing. I think uh, yeah, Matthias mentioned Uber's uh, proto tool. So like, we're starting to look at a bunch of other things to pull them in, but I can't say we have like the perfect answer yet because we're not at a point of enough adoption to say that we have something that everyone's happy with. But the shared repo thing seems to be working pretty well so far. Is that so you said that uh, your reasons for choosing GRPC was not the same as the developer's reason. So how will you go about the next change you want to make? How will you find out developer reasons and present it to them first so they don't get sad? I had a hard time hearing. <laughs> um, the, she was saying that our, the reasons that the infrastructure team uh, was really interested in gRPC ended up being different than the reasons that developers across the company cared about gRPC. So how do we reconcile that the next time we want to migrate something or the infrastructure team decides that something's right? Uh, how do we make that work for developers across the company? Yeah, I think the biggest shift for us has been just changing the perspective that we take kind of as our default. Like we, when we look at a new technology, say even something like Kubernetes versus like our existing container orchestration, it's, you know, we see the, the maintenance and management as kind of the big levers when, when just the natural like <laughs> angle that we take and, and we've stopped doing that. Uh, what we do is we really take like what, what will this experience actually look like for a developer and so in the Kubernetes case it's we'll be able to auto scale for you, we'll help you vertically and, and actually horizontally right size, we'll help kind of take a lot of the operational toil away from you, we'll help you balance workloads across geography and zones easier. Um, and so we, we've actually just shifted the perspective in terms of how we talk about value is, is not, it's, it's not in terms of infrastructure management and maintenance value, but it's in terms of actual end developer value. And I think it's similar to, to what you hear a lot of like smaller companies preaching, like somebody like Airbnb coming out and saying that it's, it's all about the experience for like that, that one end customer, like let's solve for one customer. And, and so for us, it's the same thing and just applying that to this, this infrastructure domain and it, it extends to even how we market things like this, like in the gRPC case, changing kind of the angle, but even like creating visuals, creating the Spotify stickers, like getting people excited about those sorts of things and making sure that that value proposition is clear is, has been a huge investment that we've made.
Awesome. If there's no other questions, thank you all so much. Feel free to come up and, and chat with us. Have a great rest.